Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, from the 11 Bang Bang channel. Parry this, you filthy casual! Everybody out there, welcome to another episode of the 11 Bang Bang channel, weapons of the 17th century. Uh, this is a Thanksgiving special we're gonna do on the, uh, I better pull that out of there, it's burning pretty good, on the Matchlock Musket from Military Heritage. Now we've done this several times, but this has been refinished. Look how pretty that is. And she's loaded up. So while I shoot, Garrett's gonna talk in the background. I also got some different match cord this year, which is much better. Let's see here. I'm gonna fall where I want it. Alrighty, 240 grains of homemade powder. Yes, yeah, sir. Woo! That'll make the old possum squeal. <laughs> All right, everybody. So Ethan here is freezing to death. You wouldn't Just, believe it. North America's cold in November. Yeah, it's actually like 20 degrees out here right now. But here's the thing. We are shooting period correct powder for the most part. Uh, it is not compressed. It is not caked. It is not being ground. This is just a charcoal, uh, saltpeter, and uh, sulfur mixture that is 99% pure. And is like I said, it's not compressed. So the uh, powder is pretty accurate to the 17th century. Now, uh, you okay there, Ethan? My match core is burning out, <laughs> or burning down. The standard for loading a match lock in the 17th century, if you watch Captain Ball's channel, he points it out, is half the weight of the ball in powder. And since, like I said, this is pure powder, but it's not compressed, it's pretty close to the uh, standards. Like I said, it's probably more pure, so we're going with half the weight. This is a 480 grain ball, so this is a 240 grain charge. All right, Ethan, 50 yards. <sighs> Missed. We'll point that out. Hey guys, he's having trouble shooting accurately because it's cold, so this is historically correct. Yeah. So anyway, a test we're trying today, and it seemed to work right there, is we've had trouble in the past getting match locks to go off with Grafton Sun, Swiss, Go X, those kind of powders. And we had an idea it might be because they're graphite coated. 
So this is homemade powder, like I said before, and it is not graphite coated. So graphite protects against moisture. It also protects against static electricity, which means the powder has to be at a hotter burning point to ignite. So like I said, we're trying some more authentic powder for the time period, and it seems to be working without graphiting. The match seems to light it a little better. Okay guys, I'm gonna go ahead and take a shot here, but I wanted to point out a few things we're doing a little different from when you've seen this match lock before. Used to be uh, kind of the military heritage look. This is a military heritage gun, but we've antiqued the barrel, stripped all of that uh, shellac off the wood, and done it more historically accurately with linseed oil and wax. And uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, like I said, the uh, powder we're using, non-graphited, turns out it's working really, really well for a match lock. And the last thing I can say is Ethan made this juke cord here and it's burning hotter than the cords we've used in the past. He'll have a, something to say about that in a minute. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and load it up and get my shot off with it here. Kind of cool. You don't have to, if you don't screw that match cord down, you don't have to uh, worry about pulling it out because, because it uh, kicks itself out. All right, 240. I flinched, but it worked. <laughs> 240 grains is quite the charge. Where'd my cord go? Oh, don't start a fire. Before we start, I want to point out that there are two sources that I'm using predominantly for this video besides your standard internet source. And this is the book Arms and Armors of the Pilgrims. It's from 1620 to 1692 by Harold L. Peterson. And a thesis written for the Defense Academy College of Management and Technology by David P. Miller. It's called The Ballistics of 17th Century Muskets, written in May 2010 and supervised by Dr. Derek Alsop. Okay, so let's talk about the history of the firearms of the Pilgrims. This is a series we will be running once a year. The main three things we're going to be covering in this series, which as I said will take place over the course of three years, is we will be covering match locks, snap onces and wheel locks. In particular, the ones that we know were at the Plymouth Colony in the year of 1620. So, let's start with the most predominant and by far most used weapon of that era, and that is going to be the matchlock. The simple matchlock. As I said, we know there are snap locks or snap haunches, and we know there are wheel locks, but the simplicity and the low price point of the matchlock musket made it the predominant weapon of this era and it's a very good weapon now let's go back in history where did the matchlock musket come from heavy on the word musket there match tender we have, if we go back into the 13th century writings from Roger Bacon, talking about the use of black or gunpowder firearms such as cannons and things like that that were already showing up in the 1200s and even earlier into medieval Europe. Of course, these had been known in Asia before that, but they were really put to use in Europe. Now, the very first guns were handguns, which is basically just a pipe on a stick with a hole in the side you would load it with powder and a ball and you would stick either a hot iron through the side or be lit with a fuse but it was not a shoulder fired weapon and therefore not very practical to hit with a common misconception of the time was that guns immediately made the knight obsolete and people in armor this is not true as we see armor going all the way up through the 17th century almost to the 18th century and being used pretty predominantly. There is a reason. As guns came onto the battlefield, armor got better. As the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries rolled around, 
that was when you started seeing the full plate armor of the night and yes high quality suit of armor could stop a hand gone round most of the time now would it feel good probably not but if you look through history you will find guns and armor on the battlefield at the same time does that mean that everyone had armor that could stop a musket ball or a ball from one of these handguns brigadines were not very good against firearms neither were gambesons which were the predominant armor of the battlefield infantry at the time chainmail was not good at stopping anything like this but full plate armor made out of good spring steel expensive armor that a knight would wear yes generally would probably stop a hand gone so what happened we start seeing the invention of the arquebus now the hand gone or the hand cannon would eventually evolve to have a lever on it which would lower a burning match into a pan that would light a small charge that would in turn ignite the large charge this was known as the serpentine and when we move on later in the 1400s to the arquebus you will see that even though it is a shoulder fired weapon it will have that same serpentine with a few improvements the arquebus is a shoulder fired weapon that has a longer barrel generally three and a half feet long or so and it is also a caliber usually between 50 and 69. By the mid 1500s things have started to change. We see what we now call the matchlock musket. What is the difference between an arquebus and a matchlock musket? Well John Smith from the Jamestown colony which was established long before the Plymouth colony wrote that in the early 17th century what a traveler coming to the new world would need would be one set of white armor a sword yeah that powder back then fouls up a little bit and a firelock of musket caliber with a barrel of at least five and a half feet in length and this is where we get the real difference between what's considered the arquebus and what is considered the matchlock musket it must be musket caliber which means anywhere from 69 to 80 caliber the reason of this is because of the uniformity it would have with all the other musket classified firearms around meaning you could fire a round ball anywhere from 69 caliber generally up to 75 and be just fine he also said that you also needed to bring 20 pounds of black powder and 60 pounds of cat's I round ball that. and some goose shot there were bandoliers as you can see many people call them the 12 apostles this is a name from the victorian times but basically you could have 12 or more charges of powder in wooden tubes hanging around your body and a pouch on the side that holds round balls and you would wad it with whatever was available the thing is a lot of people didn't like these let's talk about the armor the armor that was used at the time especially when John Smith talks about light armor does not mean that the metal itself was light it means it's generally just a breastplate and a helmet and if you will look at the fishtail buttstock on the matchlock that is made to go against a breastplate of armor that is made to lock right up into the shoulder of the breastplate and that's why it is that funny shape were the matchlocks used by the pilgrims very effective Nathaniel Nye of 1647 a master gunner from Worcester gave a detailed description of black powder production during the Civil War period of 1647. Granted, this comes after the Pilgrims, but only by about 27 years. Nye describes the ratio of powder to be four parts saltpeter, one part brimstone, one part charcoal. If producing musket powder, it should be five one to one, five parts saltpeter, one part sulfur, one part charcoal. It's hard to establish the exact purity of the saltpeter or the grain size. This comes out to about 60% potassium nitrate, 20% charcoal, and 20% sulfur. Proof charges from Henry Rowland Gunmakers in 1631 says the proof was to be with good and sufficient gunpowder, the weight of the bullet of lead. Using this information, we can deduce the weight of powder used would be half the weight of a 12-bore musket ball which our 12 bore musket balls cast out to 480 so hence why we are using a 240 grain charge of 17th century non-compressed powder another indication of how much powder 
was used at the time as the bandoliers that we still have today. Some of these original bandoliers can carry a single charge that is more than half of the weight of the common 69 caliber round ball. Now let's talk about the paper cartridges. Paper cartridges in Europe could be found as far back as 1500s. Somewhere in the 1550s and 60s, you start to see people using paper cartridges. Now most of these originals are a round ball with the sprue left on and the paper simply tied to the sprue. You would tear the paper, dump the powder down, and then remove the ball, put the ball down, and then use the paper on top as wadding. But we also see that by the English Civil War in the 1640s, we start to see the brown best style paper cartridges that we are using here in this video where the ball is completely wrapped. Very much better than the bandoliers of the time. There are reports of people blowing themselves up trying to use the quote unquote 12 apostles or bandoliers of the time. Not only that, they were known for making noise when you were trying to sneak around at night and also known for being tangled when you were least expecting it and most needed them. And so the bandolier, although prominent in the early 17th century, really didn't last all that long. Paper cartridges were the wave of the future, and by the end of the matchlock musket, paper cartridges were what it was. Many people have questioned whether or not this type of matchlock musket that we have here was actually used at the Plymouth Colony. And after a little research, we have discovered that yes, it was. According to Arms and Armor of the Pilgrims 1620 to 1692 by Harold L. Peterson, of several matchlocks, there is a drawing of three of them that were known to have existed in the Plymouth Colony. Three matchlock muskets from left to right, an Italian musket, 1580 to 1610, believed to have been used at Plymouth before 1637 when it was sold to a nearby garrison house. The other two are German muskets. So as you can see over here on the far left, there is a sear bar type matchlock. Now the sear bar is a holdover from the old crossbow of the time, but it seemed to work well. Some people really did like that because it required more of a pull up instead of a pull back. So how long were matchlocks used? Well, we know that by 1645, Governor William Bradford of the Plymouth Colony could report that the Plymouth troops had been sent to a muster well armed with snap-ons pieces. While matchlocks were still allowed for private arms, the Plymouth General Court allowed only snap-onses or firelocks for town arms by 1645. So yes. Zero flinch. It still was being used by civilians and people out in the countryside surrounding the colony, but by 1645, militaries, especially militaries in North America, militias were using snap haunches, and there's a reason for that. The natives had gotten their hands on wheel locks and snap haunches, and the conditions of the place, time, and period did not call for a match that had to be kept burning in rain and moisture and everywhere else. Now the militaries of Europe would continue to use the matchlock all the way up almost to 1700, all the way through the English Civil War and through many other skirmishes. Now they did have snap onces besides and wheel locks, but you must remember they were better supplied with match cord. They were also able to pick and choose their battles against other militaries in more convenient places. Also, the use of pikemen was still far more predominant on the European battlefield than it was on the North American battlefield where predominantly your enemy was going to be natives. Now, the last hoorah for the matchlock musket would be in what is now known as King Philip's War. Now, King Philip was not a king from Europe. King Philip was actually a native. And in the 1670s, as I've said before, militarily matchlocks were not necessarily a thing, but still many people had them. They would put on their armor, they would pick up their matchlock, and as a militia, march to war against the native King Philip. And what is now known as the Great Swamp Fight, anyone who was there in the rain, in the swamp, in a very humid environment, who was attempting to fight with a matchlock, quickly found themselves outclassed by natives with 
not only snap-onses but true dog locks and early flint locks and that was really the last hoorah for the good old match lock as far as the North American use goes. We know now that the match lock at the time used a powder charge of non-compressed powder that was made of 60% saltpeter, 20% charcoal, 20% sulfur. And that is what we're using today. This could be done, by the way, if it was considered poor powder, they would use three quarters the weight of the round ball. We're not going to do that because we know that the saltpeter we use today is 99% pure. So we're going to assume that this is very good powder for the time and only stick with half the weight, which is the 240 grain charge. Although the matchlock was the most common weapon in the 1620s, was it the most preferred weapon? No. As a matter of fact, we have some evidence that possibly John Alden himself came to the New World with a wheel lock. Now this is up for debate because this wheel lock was found in the John Alden house, I believe in 1924. But there are some people today who debate whether or not someone like John Alden, just a cooper or carpenter, would have the finances to own such a weapon at the time of the pilgrimage. Some people assume that this was probably his son's and probably purchased these when he was a magistrate of the Plymouth Colony. Because in the original John Alden house, the one that no longer exists, they have found several snap on locks. And these snap on locks, uh, surprisingly, have had their springs removed, but the rest of them are still there. This probably has something to do with him being the carpenter, maybe making stocks for guns. As time went on and the dog lock became more predominant, the uh, flint lock itself, as we would later on know it, became more predominant, the springs were probably kept and used and reshaped because that good steel was hard to come by. William Bradford himself has spoken of the original plan of the colonists to should they run into trouble, the men with the snap haunches would jump to guard and would also jump to fight while another man would light a fire so that the men with the match locks could light their matches. So yes, even though it was the most predominant gun of the era, it was not the most preferred gun of the era. But like many other guns and many other militaries, because it was so cheap to produce, it was the predominant weapon of the pilgrims when they landed at Plymouth in 1620. Alright guys, so... Yeah, powder's starting to foul this barrel out real bad, and it's getting dark. So, as always, trusting God, or I should say, as always, thank you for watching, trusting God. <laughs> Woohoo! And keep your powder dry. Bye. That thing kind of flipped out there on me. <laughs>